Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bihar, uh, cardiologist from London, and I'm joined today uh, by Dr. Sohal and Professor Rinaldi, uh, lead investigators for the RADI CRT study that's just been presented here in Lisbon at the ERA Congress 2019. Uh, and I have the privilege to uh, discuss the results with uh, the two lead investigators. Um, so, Dr. Sohal, um, firstly, many, many congratulations on a big body of work. Um, can you first tell me um, what's the study about and what, what's it trying to address? So, I think <laughs> despite being quite a mature therapy, uh, I think it's quite clear that we kind of plateaued in terms of our utility, our ability to get response from CRT. So our response rates have stayed pretty static. Um, and I think most of the trials up to now have looked at better predictors of response. Uh, so what we really wanted to look at is it, is there something that we can do peri-implant to help tailor uh, CRT delivery using conventionally available tools uh, to the individual? Uh, and so we um, use the metric of uh, LV by DP by DT max, which is uh, a marker of cardiac contractility, certainly acutely, uh, to see if targeting uh, LV lead placement to the, uh, uh, the vein that gives you the best acute hemodynamic response try, uh, correlates to better clinical outco uh, better outcomes at six months. Uh, so that really was the premise of the study. Okay, and, uh, and who was involved? Uh, so it was uh, an international multi-centre uh, collaborative, so uh, it was um, uh, run between 10 sites in the United Kingdom and two in Milan, uh, so uh, that ranged from uh, uh, several centres in London, including ourselves at uh, Guy's and St Thomas's, uh, Bart's Heart Centre uh, and uh, other centres throughout the, the UK. Okay, and, um, and uh, so uh, Professor Rinaldi, the, the the premise of, of, of using hemodynamics, so how, for, for people that don't, uh, that don't know what it is, how, how does it work? What do you need to do uh, as an extra step? So measuring DPDT max, which measures the contractility in the ventricle. So we can measure it, and the way we measured it in the study was by using what's called a pressure wire, which is a very thin wire, 0.014 of an inch, placed within the left ventricle. And from that, you can derive left ventricular pressure and then derive contractility from that. So this measure is, in fact, the gold standard measure used to measure contractility. But in terms of CRT response, there's never been a study which has actually shown that an acute response translates into a chronic response. So that's why I think this study was very important to look at that and to see whether or not optimizing by contractility actually led to an improvement in patient outcomes, which it would seem it did in this study. Yeah, and, and also some of the early work suggested that part of the way that CRT works is by improving, uh, improving stroke volume. So I guess the, pre the preface for that was already there, but it took obviously a long time to, to get to this point. Um, uh, so, so Dr. Sehal, take me through the, uh, the, the results, the, the population uh, that you studied and what were the kind of main differences, if any, between the groups? Yeah, so it was a classic CRT uh, population. Uh, so these were uh, patients who fulfil criteria for CRT uh, by conventional criteria. So um, uh, optimally treated heart failure, still symptomatic, MYHA class 2 to 4, uh, with uh, QRS durations in excess of 120 milliseconds. Um, and I think the important things to say is that both groups, the conventional arm and the pressure wire guided arm, were well balanced. Um, and uh, there was a roughly, roughly equal split between um, ischemic and non-ischemic patients. Uh, and I think it was quite important for us that this cohort reflected the real world. So there was a significant proportion, so a quarter of patients in both groups had atrial fibrillation. Uh, and uh, a significant minority of patients had non-left bundle branch block morphology or were RV paced. Um, and in terms of the uh, procedural uh, characteristics, um, so just talk, talk me through those, how were those different if, if at all? Yeah, so I think the, the procedural time was longer mm -hmm. for the pressure wire guided arm. As you would expect. Uh, as you would expect. And so you went from a mean of 104 minutes for the conventional arm to 142 minutes for the pressure wire guided arm. And most of that was taken up uh, by uh, manoeuvring the lead and taking pressure measurements in uh, various tributaries of the coronary sinus. Um, and uh, fluoroscopy time was also significantly increased. Um, but aside from that, in terms of complications, uh, there were no, the, the complication rate was low across the study, which is um, 
uh, nice to see. But there, importantly, there was no increase in the risk of uh, hemorrhagic or thromboembolic complications, which is important because uh, you do heparinize the patient uh, yeah. with 2,500 units of heparin during the implant to cover the wire. Okay. And um, in terms of how many veins you studied, so obviously the, 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 the conventional arm, you may have needed to, to try different veins if, if you had to because yeah. of, of electrical parameters. Um, but in terms of the, the, the RADI CRT study, how, how many roughly per patient? So it was a mean of about three, three okay. veins. Per okay. Patient. So pretty much all, all, all available targets. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, uh, so on, on, to, uh, on to the results, um, what, what were the main findings? So I think our primary endpoint was the proportion of patients who demonstrated favourable uh, reversal modelling of the left ventricle. We took a, a, a reduction of end systolic volume of 15% or more yep. uh, as our definition of a responder. And 73% of patients in the pressure wire guided arm uh, demonstrated favourable reverse remodelling versus 60% uh, in the conventional arm. That was a statistically uh, significant finding. So, so a 13% absolute risk reduction. Um, fantastic. So that's quite a significant uh, endpoint. Um, so, uh, maybe Professor Rinaldi, um, so how do you think that these results um, kind of translate into to modern day CRT and where we are in 2019? I think it's becoming increasingly important to tailor therapy according to a patient. I think if we look at the results of, of this study, if we look at the subgroup analysis, most of the difference between the patients were in those patients with ischemic heart disease. So the inference from that is that what we're probably doing in this study is avoiding scarred areas within the left ventricle where you may inadvertently pass, place the left ventricular lead. So I would argue that techniques in the future to image scar, to avoid scar, are probably going to be more beneficial to patients to improve response to CRT. Okay, and what about uh, moving to the non-ischemic cohort? Were they, uh, were, they, were they as significant in terms of the effects? Or? So the, 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 uh, if you looked at the non-ischemic uh, cohort in um, isolation, uh, the response rate was 81% in the pressure wire guided arm versus 71% in the conventional arm, uh, whereas the, the, the magnitude of reduction was much greater in the ischemics. Uh, and I think that that does potentially, it's hypothesis generating stuff because the, power wasn't, the study wasn't powered to, to look specifically at that subgroup, but uh, I think it's certainly a, a hypothesis generating uh, uh, finding is that uh, a lot of the changes we saw was driven by the changes in the ischemic. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of interest in, as you, are, as you know, for, for ischemic heart disease and SCAR. Um, um, Professor Rinaldi obviously involved in lots of studies. So how, how might this, um, in parallel with some of the late breakers that we've just seen in image guidance, how, how can we take that forward? Should we be doing image guidance um, using SCAR avoidance and pressure wire measurement? Should we just be using image guidance? What, what's a practical solution for, for CRT implanters? Well, I... I think you're quite right. You need to have something that's usable yeah. in, in current daily practice. And hemodynamic monitoring may be the gold standard, but it may not be achievable in all. I personally think that uh, adopting an image-guided strategy with imaging SCAR, with techniques such as CT or MRI, is probably going to be the way forward in the future. We're, we're just about to embark on a, a multi-centered trial looking at MRI SCAR guidance in this group. So. I think that's likely to be the way ahead in this group to, to target SCAR and avoid SCAR. The only other thing I would say about the current study is that I, I think what this showed as well is that we can use DPDT as a metric. If you look at the response, if you, look at the res if you had a positive response with the DPDT, then over 80% of the patients actually went on to become chronic responders, whereas if you didn't have a positive response, only about 20 to 30 percent. So I think this study certainly validates the use of DPDT in, in, in acute studies as well in the future. Fantastic. And I guess lastly, just thinking about the actual instrumentation. So firstly, I think it's obviously really important to show the, the, the no significant change in complications, because as you said, it's instrumentation of, of, of the arterial system, heparin, etc. Uh, do you think that there's perhaps any metrics that we could use non-invasively that maybe, maybe correlate with invasive hemodynamics 
going forward, is that something that we, we should explore as a, as a community? So I think, yeah, if we can validate a link between uh, LBDPDT Max and non-invasively acquired central aortic pressure and the, the stroke volume uh, calculations you can make from those, then I think that may potentially have some merit, um, but that, that needs further validation. Okay, fantastic. Uh, and, and so any, any, any kind of final thoughts about going forward and, and, and kind of final messages for um, those implanting CRT? Um, what, what, what are the key tips to, um, to, to success, Professor Rinaldi? I think, as, as we said, I think you have to individualize the treatment. I think left ventricular lead placement does need to be guided, particularly in patients with ischemic heart disease. So, so I think that's really the main message in those patients that we know don't respond as well to the therapy. There is potentially a way now we can actually improve the outcome by a guidance strategy. And Dr. Soha, any final thoughts? Yeah, I would just echo that. I, I don't think anyone is saying that we should be using the radi wire in all patients, okay. but certainly I think there is, if we are going to invest money in implanting devices in patients, it would be nice to get a sense as to whether they're going to respond whether that takes the form of an EP study before a potential implant, but not in all patients, but that ischemic cohort, I think there is uh, potentially some merit in that. Okay, fantastic. Well, it remains me just to thank both of you for, for coming to uh, have a chat with me here at ERA uh, in, uh, in Lisbon, and congratulate you both on this uh, fantastic body of work. Thank you very much.